heartiest greetings of joy from the labyrinth at the Arizona Senior Academy in Vail. Wherever you find them, a labyrinth is always an invitation to prayer and contemplation through journeying. So heartiest greetings of joy in Jesus Christ. We welcome you to Desert Skies, a joyful community drawing people to Christ as a multi-site ministry, one church, two campuses, and here online. I'm Reverend Susan. And I'm Reverend Candace. You know, Lent is this wonderful time of reflection, of reorienting yourself to the holy. If you're visiting with us, worshiping with us for the first time this morning, we are so glad that you found us online. And I'd like to draw your attention to the bar at the top of your screen where you'll find links to our uh, Facebook page and our website. And also there is a connection card there. If you would fill that out and let us know that you're here with us and how we might be in prayer for you and how we could connect you to our community here. So now we invite you to take a deep breath as we enter into our time of worship, a time centered in this Lenten practice of prayer and the passionate search of the path of Christ as found in the gospel according to Mark. From healing, to prayer, to suffering, the disciples truly have a hard time understanding Jesus' teachings as they applied to real life, to their lives. And looking at our own measures of success today, we still struggle with understanding Jesus. Why is it so hard? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy.
Please join us in the call to worship. Today we step up a little higher on our Lenten journey. We are moving from contemplation to action. Are you ready to take the next step? Yes, we are ready. The cross is before us. Come, walk together on this journey to the cross. Lord, prepare our hearts and our spirits for this next step. Amen. gathered here in your name as an act of faith, believing that you are not only among us, but that you love us. It is often hard to recognize your love, see your mercy, and feel your presence. Help us today in our worship that we might be transparent to your grace as you reveal yourself to each one of us. Amen. I've tried in vain a thousand ways My fears to quell, my hopes to raise But what I need, your word has said Is ever only Jesus You died, you lived Your beauty and glory are endless, oh 
Jesus, I must know you more. I want to know you, Jesus, my Welcome, children. Gather around wherever you are as we imagine that, that we're together in the sanctuary at the church or maybe in Sunday school or even at a picnic. Let's use our imaginations as we gather together today. I brought something kind of fun that I enjoy today, and it's, it's a puzzle. Have you ever seen one of these? It's one of those old-timey puzzles that you have to jump one peg and take out the other. And if you're really smart, by the time you've jumped all the pegs, you only have one left. But it isn't easy. It's a puzzle. I'll bet you have some puzzles that you like to work. Maybe they're even on your uh, electronic device, like an iPhone or an iPad. Or maybe they're on paper. Puzzles can be a lot of fun, can't they? But sometimes there are things that are puzzling to us, right? That make us really have to think hard and to ask questions because we just don't understand. Maybe it's something like, why do I have to go to bed at the same time every night? Or... Why can't I just go into my brother's room and take what I want? Why do I have to share? And it might be bigger things that involve other people too, like why are some people hungry and others have so much? Or why are some people bullies and others are so hurt by them? Those are all things that we puzzle about in our minds and in our hearts. We have to think about them and work through them. And sometimes, often, we get to ask questions of the grown-ups around us, our parents, our Sunday school teachers, our pastors, even our teachers at school. And we may not understand at all for a long, long time. But someday, we can, we will understand. That's something that happened to Jesus' disciples one day. And we're going to read that scripture right after we spent our time here. They were in a boat, and Jesus said something to them, and it was puzzling to them. They couldn't figure out what Jesus meant. And the important thing is that Jesus reminded the disciples to think 
and watch and listen to all of the things that he has been teaching them, and they will start to understand. So that's why I'm glad we get to gather together as a church, whether it's online or in person, and we get to talk about these stories, and we get to read them and ask questions about them. And day by day, we start to understand more. Hey, just like Jesus' first disciples. Isn't that pretty cool that we're like them? I hope that this week you'll open your Bible and read some stories with your mom or your dad or someone close to you and think about what is it I still don't understand and start to ask questions and maybe even pray about it and see what happens and see if you don't start to understand more and more as you also start to be more and more like Jesus. Will you promise to do that for me, for us as the church? All right, thank you. Let's pray. Loving God, we're thankful for those who wrote down the stories of Jesus long, long ago. We're thankful for those who first followed Jesus long, long ago, that we can follow in their footsteps. We thank you for the people around us who we can ask questions when we have, have them, when our minds and hearts are puzzling about the whys of things and the way to follow you. Be with us this week as we learn more and more. Amen. Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. Jesus' disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, so they had only one loaf with them in the boat. He gave them strict orders, Watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees as well as the yeast of Herod. The disciples discussed this among themselves. He said this because we have no bread. Jesus knew what they were discussing and said, why are you talking about the fact that you don't have any bread? Don't you grasp what has happened? Don't you understand? Are your hearts so resistant to what God is doing? Don't you have eyes? Can't you see? Don't you have ears? Why can't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke five loaves of bread for those 5,000 people? How many baskets full of leftovers did you gather? They answered 12. And when I broke seven loaves of bread for those 4,000 people, how many baskets full of leftovers did you gather? They answered seven. Jesus said to them, and you still don't understand? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We open our hearts to God. So I was just thinking that it was almost to a day a year ago that the world as we knew it totally changed. And so maybe some of you have seen some version of this meme, either in social media or floating around the web. I love it. There's the before the pandemic uh, math problem, and there's a during the pandemic after being homeschooled part of, um, of the math problem. Or, or perhaps you have been asked by your child or grandchild to help you with math lately. Or you've tutored in our after school program and the fifth graders ask you how to show your work for a particular math problem. Or if math just isn't your thing and no one in their right mind would ask you for help on that particular subject, have you ever felt that no matter how hard you try, you just can't manage to figure it out, to get it right, to understand. I can think of several things during this past year that have been way over my head, in addition to common core math. The inner workings, for instance, of the technology that it takes to put together our worship services that we've been enjoying online this year. Making sense 
of the COVID-19 virus and all of its ramifications. Conspiracy theories, rejection of science, vitriol in the midst of simple disagreement. I mean, I could go on and I'm sure that you have your over your head subjects as well that have, you've been confronted with over the past year. So it's relatively easy to jump into Mark's gospel as he describes over and over again the bumbling, bewildered disciples as they fail to understand Jesus and what they see and hear and experience. So we can relate to them on some visceral level, which is exactly Mark's intent. Because he wants us to read about the disciples and see ourselves, see the church and the society in which we live. And so then he carefully shows how Jesus works diligently to correct misunderstandings, lack of vision, and short-sightedness in those who strive to follow him. And frankly, as much as the disciples regularly mess up and seem unbelievably slow, I have to give them the beginning of this particular experience. We read, he gave them strict orders, watch out and be on your guard for the yeast of the Pharisees as well as the yeast of Herod. <laughs> that sounds like common core math to me. I mean, what in the world is Jesus talking about? And when he closes with the slightly withering, do you not yet understand? I find myself answering with and for the disciples, <laughs> no, not really. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, I'm not altogether certain, but I can offer a guess. Perhaps it will be helpful to you or maybe prod your own thinking. And while we're at it, maybe this is a clue to explain about reading the Bible. We don't always have to understand it. It's taking it seriously and wrestling with it that really matters. So two, two clues seem most promising to me as we figure this out. First, leaven or yeast is never a good thing in the Bible. Although it's an essential ingredient of many, of many breads and we hear that the kingdom of heaven spreads like yeast, it's not allowed in many places in our scriptural text. It can't be eaten with the Passover meal. And those who eat it are actually considered cut off from the community. Leaven, you see, spreads contamination. And number two, the question would then seem to be what the leaven or the contaminant of the Pharisees and Herod is. And since we've just read about the Pharisees' demand for a sign, maybe that's another clue here. Mark, unlike the writer of the Gospel of John, for instance, doesn't describe what Jesus does as signs or miracles, but rather as acts of power evidences, indications of the kingdom of God. But that doesn't seem to be enough for the Pharisees. As we saw earlier, they want Jesus to conform to their expectations rather than to be willing to change in light of the kingdom. So also we know Herod refuses the preaching of John the Baptist relying instead on political power and influence rather than right religious and righteous conduct and trust in God to advance his particular aims. And isn't that always the temptation? To go one's own way, to insist on one's own rights, and to expect God to conform to our expectations 
rather than to be willing to release one's claims and expectations in order to hear and follow God? So here are the disciples and Jesus sitting in a boat, ready for their next adventure, and they discover that they have forgotten to bring bread for the journey. Well, they did have one loaf, but it most definitely was not going to be enough. And because they really had no clue what Jesus was talking about regarding the Pharisees and Herod, they started grumbling and worrying instead. And it really is ironic because just prior to getting into this particular boat, the disciples have experienced the two most miraculous feeding events in history. The disciples have seen and experienced Jesus' power, his compassion, his ability to provide for thousands. They were there. They helped. But instead of celebrating and wondering and rehashing the scene, or even asking Jesus what he meant by his cryptic comment, they fixate on their lack of bread. Let that sink in for a minute. The lack of bread. And Jesus says to them, in essence, are you really afraid that you don't have enough after all that you've seen? And that question begins a torrent of questions from Jesus beginning in verse 18. Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? I am guessing <coughs> that the disciples must have just looked at him with blank expressions because he continues his barrage of questions. When I broke the loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They knew the answer to that. They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect then? And they said to him, seven. And then he said to them, do you not yet understand? The disciples saw the event. They knew the answers to his questions immediately about the leftover baskets. But they didn't get the bigger picture. They were preoccupied with trivial things and they didn't see the overarching significance of Jesus's actions. And I can't help but wonder if maybe that's why the disciples keep misunderstanding Jesus's teaching and misinterpreting his acts of power. They refuse to let go of all they thought God should be and do. And why? Because surrendering one's deeply cherished expectations is a kind of dying really difficult to do even when you know the result is God's coming kingdom. Do you not yet understand? Well, no. Or maybe yes, but they and we are not always quite ready to accept what God requires the death of their and our dreams, that they and we might experience the life that Jesus brings. And as this story goes on, we'll see just how far they and we will go to perpetuate our ongoing denial about what is required to follow Jesus. And yet, God never gives up on us God continues to call us to a deeper understanding of the things of the kingdom, even though we, like the disciples of old at times, 
have a hard time grasping the depths of what Jesus has to teach us. This reminds me of the story of the old man who was walking along a Florida beach and stumbled across an old lamp. He picked it up and rubbed it, and out popped a genie. The genie said, okay, you release me from the lamp, blah, blah, blah. This is the fourth time this month, and I'm getting a little sick of those wishes, so you can forget about three. You get one wish. So the man sat thought about it for a while and said, I've always wanted to go to Hawaii, but I'm scared to fly and I get really seasick. So could you build me a bridge to Hawaii so that I can drive over there to visit? The genie laughed and said, that's impossible. Think of the logistics of that. How would supports ever reach the bottom of the Pacific? Think how much concrete, how much steel. <coughs> no, you got to think of another wish. The man said, okay, I'll try to think of a really good wish. And finally he said, all right, I've got it. I've been married and divorced four times. My wives always said that I don't care and that I'm insensitive. So I wish that I could understand women, how they feel inside, what they're thinking when they give me the silent treatment, know why they're crying, know what they really want when they say nothing, and know how to make them truly happy. And the genie said, do you want that bridge to be two lanes or four? <laughs> I am so grateful that God is not like that genie, giving up on our understanding and growing in our knowledge of God and God's ways. So imagine with me for a moment this scenario. You take your two-year-old to the doctor and he gets a shot in his arm, and it really hurts. He doesn't understand that the shot is there to make him better. All he knows is that the shot hurt, and you, you just stood there. Don't you know how bad a shot hurts? Weren't you, were you unable to stop the nurse from giving him the shot? So the little boy gets all of his friends together, <coughs> in a two-year-old sort of a way, and tells them how painful that shot was and how powerless you were to stop it from happening. Is any of that true? Do you know how painful a shot is? Of course. Of course you do. You've had many of them. Were you powerless to stop the shot? No. You brought him in for the shot, and you could have stopped it at any time. Don't you care? Of course you care very much. You suffer to see your boy suffer, but you know it's for your child's best. So what's the problem? A two-year-old's understanding is limited. And as a child of God, your understanding is limited. And as much as a toddler's understanding is limited in comparison to yours, so is your understanding limited in comparison to God. So let's not be too hard on those early disciples or on ourselves. Through Bible studies together, serving in community to provide bread for those who need it, through experience such as confirmation and small groups where our knowledge and understanding is challenged and encouraged together. We who are learning to follow Jesus each and every day of our lives have God and one another on our side. God who never gives up on us, who wants desperately to show us what eternal life truly is and just spends a whole lot of time helping us understand it. 
No, we may not yet fully understand, but we will. We will. Amen. We have heard the word of God, the word of love. Lord, have mercy. We have heard the word of God, the word of grace. Christ, have mercy. We've heard the word of God, the word of service and ministry. Lord, have mercy. And now let us enter into a time of prayer. You stop us in our tracks, O oh Lord, with your reminder that discipleship is not a sometime thing. We're called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you, to serve you by caring for others, not just once in a while, but always. We admit that we're not always ready to do this. The demand is great. The need is great. Our energies are limited. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care. You will give us the strength and courage that we will need for this step on the journey. Be with us. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all your people. You are never far away. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For it's tropical cyclone Deneo, and it's expected to become. This is by far worse than any I've seen. Absolutely a huge fire. There's an old definition of a disaster, and that's to be without a star. And the thing that happens many times after disasters is that the power goes out in some places, and people can actually see the stars but they can also see the stars in one another. Peace that would pass his understanding and with leadership that would guide people through their time of need. AMCOA, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, is the disaster and the development uh, arm of the whole United Methodist Church. When you give to AMCOA, you give 100% to the project you are supporting and to the disaster you want to respond to. This is only possible because on AMCOR Sunday, the United Methodist people raise funds so that the administrative costs of AMCOR are already covered. Well, AMCOR, of course, responds to emergencies with funding, training, and expertise, but we're mostly known for being in it for the long haul. Uh, we work alongside the conferences as they set up projects and programs to try to see families and individuals through to their recovery, which sometimes takes months and most often years. 
We're very busy, we're a very small team, but we work hard then. Omcor exists because of the donation of its members, it's the UMC people. So if there is a million people giving a $1 each, it makes more than one person giving 10,000. Amcor has been for more than 75 years in this business of being hope, of being there for people in need in the moment of disaster when they have lost everything. And through Amcor, the United Methodist people are hope in these situations. You know, walls are coming down, um, people are, are coming together. And they don't have power yet, but they're still finding ways to feed each other. And that feeds the soul, not just the body. Lift up those who have fallen. What a privilege it is those. to be part of this important ministry, the United Methodist Church, to be able to say we're there, we bring hope, and we bring healing. As people are helping their neighbor and helping each other in their community, they begin to see that the love of God has not left them. It's right there. So UMCOR wants to support that wonderful thing that can happen after disasters. UMCOR wants to be there with the people who are noticing the stars in one another, and they're noticing God's grace all around them. Good morning. I'm Mary Jo Floyd, one of your lay leaders at Desert Skies. Through this invitation to share our gifts, we acknowledge that God has blessed us abundantly and that we are to be a blessing to the world. In the very act of giving, in the very act of bestowing blessings on another, we find that we are blessed yet again. I encourage you now to enter fully into the amazing cycle of blessing. Today is UMCOR Sunday, and Desert Skies has always been a staunch supporter of this ministry, which reaches around the globe in times of disaster. This is the time in the service when we generously give out of our abundance with which we have been blessed. We ask that you prepare your offering check and your special offering check and place them in an envelope and mail them to Desert Skies at 3255 North Houghton Road, Tucson, Arizona, 85749. Or go to our website at www.desertskiesumc.org www.desertskiesumc.org and click on the donate button. Generous God, you shower us with gifts, including the greatest gift of all, your own Son, Jesus Christ. In thanksgiving and praise, we offer you our time, our money, and our very selves. In these actions, we proclaim our intention to be a blessing in your world, as together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After a year of being apart in so many ways and finally starting to reopen and come back together, there are a lot of things that maybe we might feel a little bit clueless about um, as we start that gathering process. And so we really encourage you to take advantage of a lot of those things that connect us and bring us together. Uh, Christ Cafe online, our Facebook page where we have conversations going as we chuckle together over the Friday funnies or as we think together about the thoughtful memes that are put there um, on our website as we look at the things that are changing and our staff and the ministries that are going on um, that we can get updated through our website. Um, and of course, our connection card where we can put our presence. Um, you can let us know that you're here, that you're joining with us, as well as those things that are on your heart in the form of prayers. All those are ways that we can continue to connect, um, even as we start being together more and more and more in person. I also want to uh, get you all excited about our choir cantata uh, that will be coming on Palm Sunday. You can like get your little bubble group together and watch it together at home on your television set, or we will have it on the big screens here in the sanctuary. Um, we can fit about 100 people in our sanctuary and stay socially distanced and safe. And so we would invite you to plan on watching um, that cantata and entering into that worship experience um, in whatever way I, that you possibly can. Uh, so we're really, really excited um, about our choir coming together as they can in these days to share that gift of music um, that we, all of us, have been um, richly blessed by in so many ways. And now receive the blessing. The step of discipleship requires commitment and faith. So go now in peace, bringing the good news of Jesus' love to all people. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Amen. <laughs>